you heard on the last panel about you know doing the impossible. And our next two panelists are doing what a lot of people thought was impossible. Please welcome our moderator, James Bates, President and CEO of AdvyNow Medical, an AI healthcare or company. Um, John, Dr. John Galgiani, Director of the Valley Fever Center for Excellence. And John, I'm gonna wanna see and hear about that t-shirt. And of course, Stephen Albert Johnston. So gentlemen, the floor is yours. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you two distinguished gentlemen. Um, as Joan mentioned, I am actually a recipient of the Mayo ASU collaboration. So I'm somewhat affiliated with ASU. And then my son goes to medical school at University of Arizona right now. So there's a little bit of a battle within me, and now we also have a battle on the stage here. So maybe we'll start by just a short introduction with you, Stefan, and a little bit about Calvary, and I understand your association you have at, with university, and then we'll move on to. Um, first thing I want to say, I would think that ASU could do a better job on the audio <laughs> with, with all the money that they spent on this building. Um, so I'm Stefan Johnston. I'm CEO of Calvary. Calvary is a spin out from ASU and the uh, focus is on cancer vaccines and diagnostics. Dr. Galgiani. Hi, it's John Galgiani. Um, I am a professor of medicine now at the University of Arizona. Um, I, I got here in 1978, uh, and uh, I've lived in Arizona now longer than any place else in the world. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking about the Valley Fever Center for Excellence, which is tucked into the uh, University of Arizona College of Medicine in Tucson. Excellent. I mean, both of these, obviously, cancer, one of the most devastating illnesses of our time, been challenged for centuries, as long as the human species goes around. And valley fever has also been one of those diseases which is elusive in not only a cure, but a treatment for people who are suffering from it. So these are both moonshots, if you will. Dr. Galgiani, why don't you talk about how you started out with this moonshot of valley fever and how it led into the center that, that you're leading? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a really interesting journey. Um, and before you can start talking about um, doing something about something, you have to figure out there's a problem. And so I said I got here in 19, whatever I said, 78, and um, I had as a fellow at Stanford, been doing some fungal research in a variety of different fungi. But when I uh, took a job at the University of Arizona, the obvious fungus to start thinking about in, in uh, detail was coccidiotomycosis. That's this one here. <laughs> this shirt, by the way, was uh, designed by one of our students. And uh, some of you might have been lucky enough to get a winner in the raffle last night. But um, I think it's a wonderful shirt. Um, and if we have time, I'll tell you how to pronounce coccidioidomycosis. But anyway, um, so I uh, found not only was it the obvious fungus for me to get interested in, but basically it was being ignored across the entire state. That, um, you know, it was just not being paid any attention. And uh, Ruben Bresser was my department chair at the time. And I was telling him that I was thinking of working on coccidiotomycosis, and he said, why? <laughs> and it was just like, well, I mean, you know, it's there. I mean, it was just not something to do anything about. And so um, I then kept going and actually got very interested in coccy. And then I went on sabbatical uh, in 1995. Anyone here had a sabbatical? I'm the only one in this room that's had a sabbatical. <laughs> Sabbaticals I guess, aren't really a thing nowadays, <laughs> I guess. When you have a block of time, you know, um, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> when you have a block of time in mid-career to just wake up and say, what am I going to do today? And it was during that time um, when I was in UC Davis, I realized, you know, I'm interested in this disease, but 
we got this land grant institution in the state where there's two thirds of all U.S. infections, not paying much attention to it. And so when I came back, I asked John Law, who was a good friend and helped me in my research in biochemistry, what about the idea of a Valley Fever Center? And I figured I'd be laughed out of his office, but he said, no, that's a pretty interesting idea. So, so he showed me how to write a proposal for a center and Paul Seifert took it to the Board of Regents and it was passed and it was passed unanimously because I didn't ask for any money. Um, but um, that's how that thing got started. At the time I um, said, and of course we'll put this in the College of Medicine, which is my primary appointment in medicine. And I brought that to the, the leadership there, and it was, no, we, really just, we don't really need a center for valley fever in the College of Medicine in Tucson, <laughs> literally. Um, and there were other reasons for that, but that was basically it. And um, I was really glad to see that there's a Mike Kasanovich um, uh, uh, award, who, uh, does anyone besides me know about Mike? You probably know Mike. <laughs> well, I could just spend the rest of the hour, which I won't, talking about Mike. He's just topping it himself. But, but he said, sure, you, this is a great idea. And he put me in Arizona Research Lab, which was when he was vice president for health uh, for research he had created. So that's where I, the Valley Fever Center existed on main campus for the first several years. But now it's in the College of Medicine. And um, I guess I'm trying to say that I've watched over this period of time um, both leadership at the University of Arizona realize, and I think it's because there then became a center that was productive and doing things, and then out of it fell a vaccine candidate, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, a little bit later. Uh, not because we were looking, well, we all wanted a vaccine for lots of reasons, but, but the research that was being done was fundamental research about the pathogenesis of the fungus causing disease in people. And out of that popped an application to prevent valley fever, which is to dogs, and I hope to go to hu humans. And I think it was just uh, that kind of thing. So I think we are now getting the awareness, which now leads to the obvious, well, shouldn't we do something about it? So I, I have to ask the follow-up question. It's always wonderful to get an approval for something with no funding, but then how did you get funding? Well, the funding came from research grants primarily, and also philanthropic uh, funds, a, a small, foundation who likes to stay anonymous so I won't mention what it is but it's in Manhattan New York uh, shortly after we founded the center started giving us three hundred thousand dollars a year and uh, there's reasons for that but it was every year it was not promised renewable but every year we kept getting that so we had that as core support and we also were then getting uh, uh, successful uh, research awards from NIH and some other sites. And now, for instance, we have an Arizona Board of Regents grant to study coxie in the environment, so other things like that. So it was like that. But uh, I, and it, I think f uh, philanthropic support is really, is, uh, is one of the ways you get things done that is impossible otherwise. Yeah, fantastic story. I love the getting approval with no funding. That's, that's the, the, key, the key first step. So Stefan, Calvary is a, is a wonderful organization. You guys have a promise to actually cure cancer. Why don't you walk us through that journey a little bit and, and give us that history? No, we're not going to cure cancer. We're going Come to Come on, the cure cancer, cancer. story. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's a, a mindset that people have to change. Is that uh, Our goal is to basically make that cyclotron that's over here at Mayo obsolete as fast as possible. Um, that, we shouldn't, that shouldn't be the future of cancer. Uh, the future of cancer should be that you don't get it. And we started out about 20 years ago thinking that maybe that was possible. And, um, and it's a long story, but I won't go into it, but it ended up uh, being tested that whether you could actually pr develop a vaccine to prevent cancer in a large dog study, which we've been conducting, which is almost completed in 800 dogs. And it looks very clear that it was actually relatively simple to make a vaccine to prevent cancer. Wow, when you say relatively simple, that, that brings up a lot of interesting thoughts of couldn't this, this have been done years ago? So what, what are your thoughts on that? Is this, are we a little bit behind or we just had a wrong mindset or what, what's yes. going on? It's the cancer community is very stodgy. It's very rutted in its thought processes. And so um, uh, that's what's held it back. The community, if it had gotten 
took the moonshot and war uh, statements f for real and actually tried to do uh, what could have been done, uh, we could have already had a vaccine to prevent cancer. So what is your background that led to this fundamental thought? Uh, <laughs> so I, I think of myself as an inventor, and inventors, their ideal thing is to find an area where there hasn't been much progress, and so uh, that certain cancer certainly qualifies for that. And so uh, that either means it's impossible to do something dramatic or that people haven't thought of anything yet. And so we assumed it was the latter and we were right. Well, it's, it's just really fantastic. So if you think about the study that's going on with canines at the moment, um, you said it's almost complete. Are, is there some preliminary results that you could share with the group? Yeah, it's very clear that the dogs that had a good vaccine take have a far uh, decreased incidence of certain cancers. Not all cancers, but certain cancers. And deaths from cancer. Any other side, side effects that you're saying? No, that's important because over 400 dogs got this vaccine and there's uh, no, uh, we've had two independent data safety monitoring boards look at it and there's no uh, side effects from the vaccine. Yeah, my home is, is a dog home. My, my wife has three dogs, which she calls our daughters because I have three sons. So we have to match how many male children with, you know, female dogs, apparently. So I've actually seen dogs go through the full age cycle. And I don't think I've ever had a dog that didn't develop tumors and cancer later on in its life. It seems like just the normal process. So if this is preventing cancer at, at, a, at a level and a rate, how many years are we expecting the dogs to continue to live? Or are they just dying from other things of old age? Where, where do you kind of see that going? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so dogs have the same lifetime risk of cancer as people, essentially, about 30 to 40 percent. And the, the, uh, the, the demography of that incidence maps people almost exactly, just move seven years. Um, so it, there's six years rather than 60 is that the, there's an uptake in incidence. So that it would have an effect, and we've already seen that effect, by decreasing the, the incidence of cancer, you, you change the life expectancy of the dog population. But that doesn't mean that they're not dying of other things. They do die of heart disease, they die of dementia, they die of uh, arthritis, you know, when they're too old they're put down. So those are the other things that will, will be a challenge for the longevity of dogs. So I guess the big question is how does this correlate to humans? Um, the canine body is obviously significantly different in the way it reacts to disease in many ways, but does this correlate directly to humans? It will actually be easier to make a vaccine in people because in dogs the, uh, the tumors develop about seven times faster than they do in people. So there's not much of a window to actually prevent the cancer. In humans, the ontogeny of a tumor can take anywhere from five to 20 years. That gives us a much bigger window to prevent the cancer. So we think it'll be easier to make a preventative vaccine in people. So is a preventative vaccine given to everyone or given to people who are showing cancerous signs? Well, if you give it to somebody who's showing cancer signs, it's not preventative. True. And so um, that's why we don't call this a cure, we call it a prevention. And um, that will have to be worked out, but the expectation it would be given to people, where, just like I said, where the risk rate increases at about 60 years old in people. So let's jump over to, to Valley Fever. Um, so you also have a vaccine for Valley Fever going down the pipe here. Where, where are we on the studies and, and when can we expect something there? Right, I, you know, when you said, I, I know a lot of people with dogs, and when you said you, you thought you didn't remember one that hadn't gotten a cancer, I thought you were gonna say, I didn't remember one that hadn't gotten uh, valley fever, <laughs> at least around here. It's a big problem in dogs. And um, I mentioned that um, Mark Orbach and Lisa Schubitz at the university in the, in the Valley Fever Center, who only were working together because we'd created a center. Those people didn't know each other, except that we got them to work together on Coxie. And they, they, they developed a vaccine. And uh, we, it was really a, a very wonderful vaccine in mice. And what do we do next? 
and uh, the NIH uh, put out a request for proposals where they actually said, uh, we're interested in proposals for small market vaccines. And they actually said in the RFA, for example, coccidioidomycosis. And so I thought we should write a proposal to that RFA. And we did and got funded. And it required us to have a uh, company as a partner. And to Anna Vive and um, uh, Dylan Ball's great credit, uh, they uh, took the chance to partner with us at that point in time on um, this grant proposal. And we got funded. And the proposal was to create a vaccine to go to market. Uh, this is an NIH research award uh, to prevent valley fever in dogs. And um, that w the argument sold not so much because it would be great for dogs and pet owners, but because if we showed that, it would be a proof of concept that the vaccine ought to go further to humans, which is where I'm coming from. And um, to summarize, we, we did it. The, the vaccine is a fantastically good vaccine. It's the best of both worlds. It's a live vaccine. So you get whole cell presentation and you get multiple pathways of immunity stimulated. And uh, the basis for the live vaccine is the deletion of a gene, which is essential for the tissue phase of the fungus. So it is first generation incompetent. It's live when you give it as a vaccine, but it goes away in the first several days. It doesn't survive in tissue. And so uh, it's really a great vaccine. And um, I think uh, we are gonna try next, to, it, it, uh, you, to, ask, uh, to answer your question, where are we? It's in process with the USDA uh, for, for approval. Um, that's gonna take some time, not because we have any unanswered questions, we're, at least in terms of the biology, uh, but it's just a process that takes a while. But we're hopeful that maybe by 2024, this will be a product in veterinary offices. Fantastic. So this is used mainly today for animals. It would be a veterinary vaccine. Veterinary vaccine. Um, what about humans? Well, it's, um, it's about 10 to 20 times as expensive to take it from here to there. And uh, I think that a public-private partnership is what started the work for the for the canine vaccine, and I'm very hopeful, and we're working very hard to make the case because it's basically a 1.5 billion dollar disease to just parts of Arizona and California, um, and so even if it's two, three hundred million dollars to get it through the FDA, that's very, very justified expense, uh, and I think it, the public health benefit would be enormous, and I think. Uh, you know, I, it would be good for the state of Arizona to, if somebody said, what about this disease you have in Arizona? Uh, you know, I'm worried about uh, moving my uh, workforce where they have this valley. I, well, no, you can prevent it. We have a vaccine to prevent it. I, I think it very much uh, should be uh, something we should do that way. Well, that, it's the first time I've heard that it was an Arizona disease, so this is actually educational for me over yesterday and today, uh, as you said in your video. Um, but as, as we're moving it, if we were going to, let's say you had the funding to move forward with human trials, um, what is the time do you think that it'd take? We're looking right. at five years, 10 years? No, well, somewhere between that. I, I, my number's eight. Uh, the, the pivotal trial, it's not like uh, COVID where you had everyone getting infected, so you could do randomized trials in weeks. Uh, this disease, the final pivotal trial would take about three years. You have to enroll placebo or vaccinated and then see which group does better. A and that's the last stage of it though. I, I think what I think is really gratifying in addition to having Anavive on board and wanting to see this move forward, we also have every step of what we would need, including the physician scientist, Tom Monath, who is a rock star uh, vaccinologist, uh, would be the person that would take us. He's taken four other vaccines through the FDA to approval in the past, and he's been working with us for the last three years and very much thinks this vaccine will work too. So, so we could do this. Uh, we have every step pretty well pegged. It's just a matter of finding the resources to do it. So I guess the, last, the last question. Um, is, do we expect the structure of the vaccine 
between dogs and humans to be exactly the same, or are we expecting significant change? Uh, the principle of the vaccine won't change. I'm, uh, I'm quite certain of that. That's done. Um, there are changes that could be made, uh, and it, we haven't really entered into the conversations we need to have with the FDA about what they're going to do. There has never been a fungal vaccine before. This would be the first. In fact, there's no eukaryotic vaccine. Malaria is trying to be a live eukaryotic vaccine, but um, if we beat them, uh, we will be the first live eukaryotic vaccine. So there's no well-worn path, and they're going to have to figure this out. Uh, this vaccine has a uh, antibiotic uh, selection marker in it. Uh, we could take it out, uh, and they, you know, whether the FDA requires that or not is what we'll discuss. Uh, but um, I think I think it'll be based on the safety of the product, and I and I think probably the formulation may change a little bit to the one that's going to be used immediately. But but those are details in terms of what the product and the packaging will look like. All right, I said that was the last question, but I guess I lied. Um, marketability of Valley Fever with with dogs, um, as I mentioned when I was talking to Stefan. You know, as a, as a dog owner, I'm very aware of tumors that my dog gets, right? You, you can see those, you know what's going on. With valley fever, I don't even know if my dog has valley fever. Well, I can tell you that the veterinarians, uh, certainly in Arizona, I believe also in the Central Valley, are lined up waiting for this vaccine. They, they test for valley fever way better. <laughs> They're much better at diagnosing coxie in dogs. It's three to four times as frequent as a clinical illness in dogs and and so they they diagnose it all the time and if they had a prevention they'd love to use it so i don't and and the market is going to be to the endemic regions we're not talking about having to have sales force across the united states we're pretty much talking about you know half of the <laughs> problems in maricopa county so you know you could pretty much target your your sales to three or four counties in arizona and one or two counties three counties in in california and cover 95 percent of the of the market Fantastic. Uh, Stefan, um, for Calvary, so similar type of questions. Do we, do we expect the structure of the vaccine to be similar? And then from a, a marketability in the canine space, are we expanding to cats, you know, guinea pigs, rabbits? You know, what, what, where, what is the extent of, of this vaccine within the animal space and then as you're moving into the human space? Right. Um, as far as the structure, we actually are working on a version two that right now that will be an improved structure um, that may actually use Eldevron as one of the, the uh, sources um, for delivery for the dogs and to bring down the cost of goods also. Um, as far as the, uh, the adjuvant uh, that we use for dogs, it'll be probably we'll get rid of that because there was some problems with that. Uh, so there'll be some minor changes before it goes to humans, but the the core of it, in terms of the antigens in it, will will be the same. Um, and then, what was the other question? Yes. Um, other animals. Oh, yeah, cats. Yeah, it, cats are are a, a potential market, but that's probably cat. Maybe horses, but that's about it. So you don't see with with other farm animals like cows or you know, horses you mentioned. Yeah, you anything. have to have something that lives long enough to get cancer. So it's, it's, a chicken isn't a good candidate. And so, um, but uh, I do want to point out and make uh, that dogs are not a model. Uh, dogs are the potential market value of a preventative can cancer vaccine is, in dogs is in excess of $5 billion a year in the U.S. alone. Uh, most people don't realize that uh, there's three times as many cancers in dogs each year as there are in people in the United States. So the dogs are a really very potentially lucrative market, particu particularly in cancer. All right, and then the, the, we'll end with one more question and maybe take a couple questions from the audience. Um, where do you go next? I mean, these are phenomenal moonshots, phenomenal progress. Uh, what is the next step? Any other indications that you think this type of solution can be for? Well, I'm, I'm pretty much painted into a corner around coxidotomycosis. So I'm going to be quite satisfied if we uh, can solve this one. Um, 
I I think um, there is maybe a general idea that you can have things in plain sight and ignore them for long periods of time. Um, and I think that for this disease hopefully is changing in Arizona, that people are now starting to realize we should do something about it. I can tell you that in the Central Valley of California, people vote on what their congressmen are doing about valley fever. Um, and because they're very, very mobilized, that they, partly because many of those people grew up there and they know somebody or they themselves had a really bad experience with valley fever. People die of this disease. Not everyone, fortunately. In fact, it's, it's relatively small numbers, but they do. Like um, Sterling Lewis, one of uh, uh, Rob Gronkowski's uh, teammates at the University of Arizona, uh, three years ago, uh, went back home back to Texas and got valley fever and died. Young man. I mean, that stuff just happens. And that's what was happening and has been happening in the Central Valley. And people knew that kind of story in high school and that kind of stuff. And, and so they vote on it. And I think we should be doing that in Arizona, too. I mean, this is our problem. And the more we start addressing it, now that we know, oh, it's here, we can do something about it. Uh, the, you know, if you don't ask the question, you don't get the answer. Same question. Well, first of all, I fully support what John said. I think the universities in the state have been remiss in not doing what they should be doing for Valley Fever. Um, I'm not satisfied. Uh, we've spent a lot of time building this platform, which we think has other applications. Probably the next one we'll look at is aging. We think we can develop a vaccine for aging. A vaccine for aging? Yes. So I get vaccine, I'm 52, I stay 52. Well, or can you, I go back to 26? That would be preferred. At, at least you'll get to 53 slower. <laughs> that is fantastic. We have two absolutely revolutionary thought leaders up here. Any questions from the audience that we can ask them? The, the work both of you have done are just, is just remarkable. Um, let me ask Dr. Johnson for a quick second. When we're talking about vaccine therapy, especially for preventive vaccines, which are, again, very unusual, we're obviously usually using vaccines for prevention, treatment, and a variety of other things. But it also brings up the issue that if you're basically making a vaccine, it means you have a diagnostic capability, usually, means, in this case, prevention, means potentially therapeutic. What was the breakthrough that truly launched this opportunity in terms of cancer? because hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent at the DNA level to, do, to try to do exactly what you are saying that we can do, at least in dogs. What makes what you have done so different than what has been done before? Looked under a different lamppost. So everybody else was looking at DNA, and we decided to look at the RNA, which makes perfectly logical sense, but the, nobody in the cancer community did that. And that led to the discovery of antigens that could create a, a preventative vaccine. So you don't need tissue, you can do it in blood. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Stefan. So when we look at these, you know, you can't do that, right? John, you faced um, repeated, oh well, we don't need that. You know, we why do you why are you bothering with that? And Stefan? Okay, I've been in rooms with luminaries of the industry that say, why are you wasting your time on that? That won't work. When you're faced with those attitudes, how do you stick to what you believe is possible and keep moving forward? Because for our entrepreneurs, Many of them are trying to do something that people think is impossible, and they're getting those no's all the time. So what would you say to them? John? Well, you know, I will speak to the environment here in Arizona. Um, you know, I was left alone. People might have thought, this is something I'm not going to do but they tolerated the fact that I went off and wanted to do what I wanted to do. That's not true at uh, other places I've been. 
you know, you just, you get crowded out. And um, I actually, for a long time, thought that people tolerating what I was doing was a sign of support. <laughs> Uh, because I wasn't being, uh, you know, <laughs> I, uh, you know, my lock still worked when I op tried to open my door. Um, and so that's, but I think that's true here in Arizona, that you have space to, to go in the direction you think you uh, want to go in. And, um, and I think that's, that's really good. So I think the fact that people thought it was the wrong way to go, they still were tolerant and let me uh, play in my sandbox. Um, I take a little different approach to biomedicine and biomedical problems, and that is that I take the bio out of biology. Just forget about the biology and just think about the problem as a logical problem. And I think as long as I kept going back to the logic of what we were trying to do and assuring myself that the logic held, then I kept going in spite of what everybody else was saying for biological reasons it wouldn't work. So I think that was, uh, to me, that was the most important thing. Take the bio out of biology. Thanks. And I actually have a question for James. So, you know, we talk about this future-looking thing. So in 19, oh my gosh. So in 1982, I was um, doing some work with the company that would become LSI Logic. And we were creating videos looking at what the world would be like today, where we were talking to computers and we were using touch screens and, um, and computers had the power to do this. And everybody laughed at us and said that, you know, we were playing with Star Trek. Um, today, you're building a company based on AI. Are people starting to believe they are. Um, I'd have to say, you know, pre-pandemic, I would go into a doctor's office and I would say, we completely automate the whole medical encounter for you, as well as scribing the visit and coding it and leave, kind of leave the annoying part of medicine out of your hands. And they would look at me and they're like, well, we don't trust that. I'm not sure that that's a good idea. And they'd spend, you know, literally months trying to break the AI and, you know, large hospital systems that we engaged with, including Mayo, we're, we're, we're doing that. Um, but then when, when after the pandemic hit and they got inundated with actually more overhead, more bureaucratic bureaucracy, bureaucracy than they've ever had, people were dropping left and right out of the medical industry, they came to the conclusion that it cannot exist the way it is today. The future has to be different. And then when, of course, ChatGPT came out, they're like, wait a minute, generative AI. And I'm like, yeah, we've been doing that since 2016. Not, not exciting, ChatGPT. Uh, but they're like, wow, ChatGPT is cool. What, is it, what does that have you now? And all of a sudden it became very easy to sell. And so now everybody's looking at it and they're like, we need an AI strategy automating the medical encounter literally cutting the healthcare costs by 50% is realizable through artificial intelligence. And that's just pulling the fat out. I mean, allowing doctors to be doctors again, and then gentlemen like we have here up on the stage to invent cures that really change medicine. The future is, is something like we can't even imagine today. And you know, as, as we look towards the future, new technologies that allow us to take costs out of medicine because the baby boom generation, my generation, is going to bankrupt the Western world and our needs for health care if we don't figure out how to do it smarter. That means having more efficient hospital systems, more efficient billing and payable systems, um, but most importantly, the best way to practice medicine is to have the opportunity to prevent disease from happening in the first place. We are sitting in the presence of someone who is working on a vaccine to prevent cancer from starting in the first place. And a pioneer who is getting very close to bringing to market the world's first vaccine for fungal disease. That is pretty cool, 
and you were here today to hear about it.